going to have a condensed version of what we had planned. Uh, initially, then, I, would, I was uh, scheduled to speak for five minutes, and then about 30 minutes for uh, questions addressed to the panelists. Uh, the, uh, well, how do I say that? The uh, mature, or oh. <laughs> those who have been around for some time, uh, and then the question, five minutes for our young uh, person, the voice of the, the youth of the future. And then the Q&A uh, with the uh, engagement with the audience. And then we had planned five minutes for forward-looking final remarks from uh, each of the panelists, and then one final word of appreciation. So we're going to be a condensed version of all that. Uh, what is quite uh, remarkable is uh, how well, um, even if it was uh, scheduled differently, structured differently, I personally see, see a sequence that is uh, very well uh, coordinated. From the uh, discussions we had yesterday, the challenges and some of the opportunities, and today we had, after the opening ceremonies, we had an illustration of some of those challenges. We discussed them very broadly yesterday, but today we have illustration of the challenges and some of the prospects and solutions, uh, which leads us to this uh, very important panel. Education for what? It's not for its own sake. There are discussions about education, whether it is an investment or uh, an, uh, a consumption. But in any case, whether an investment or consumption, education is to go beyond the acquisition of the skills, the acquisition of the values. And so the fundamental questions that uh, need to be asked are the work, the connection, uh, in my field of, of education, we have this model, the production function model, which is uh, borrowed from the economists, where you have the input, all the factors, individual, social, you name it, that constitute the ingredient for uh, the transformative process with the institutional context. And then we have the uh, output, the output which uh, traditionally have been measured in terms of cognitive skills, even if there are also values that are more and more uh, considered. And then uh, finally, in the current context, and this is what is connected to the topic of our uh, panel here, is how do you go beyond the traditional ways of training learners at any level from the basic uh, um, a primary, even preschool, all the way to the university, the higher education in general. The creative capacity of the learners is something that is becoming more and more important as issues are being raised about the ability of the learners to also think of creating jobs or inventing as opposed to obtaining, securing technical skills uh, so that they can be placed in the system that uh, already exists. So um, I have raised a few broad questions uh, considering the specific objectives of uh, the conference, which are part of the broad goal or, and mission of the uh, um, Africa America Institute and particularly the focus of uh, this uh, day one, uh, pathways for youth livelihoods. That's what the general uh, focus is. And then specifically, we're going to deal with the future of work, educating African youth and workforce development. So here some of the, are some of the questions. And when you, you speak, uh, what we agreed on was that you would use one minute or so 
to introduce yourself. What is the most significant aspect of your own experience that you think is relevant for this uh, audience and our discussion? So here are some of the broad questions that have been um, formulated. Um, one deals with the, uh, the African Youth Charter articulate the strategy and direction for the youth empowerment and development of activities. And it defines also the African youth as any person aged between 15 and 35. And when we include that, I think some one speaker uh, earlier talked about the proportion of those uh, aged between that uh, the lower part and then uh, 24 or 25. But here, when we go up to 35, it increases even further the proportion of the young people that we were talking about that uh, constitute part of the major issue. So considering all these demographic factors, the large proportion of young people, and also a population that's still growing, what can be done? What are the possibilities of finding innovative and effective solutions that can be considered appropriate, relevant, given those challenges, the needs of Africa, within the context of the 21st century, which is also characterized by the innovations in technology? So all these elements will be reflected in some of the answers. The second uh, question is um, what actually does it mean? What does it mean in terms of the future of work uh, so that Africa will not miss the train of what is being articulated as the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution? Uh, and then uh, we would like uh, the panelists to shed light on the issues of inclusive policy, inclusive policy, factoring in educational systems or the sources of social differentiation to ensure the respect of the basic human right for all to have access to education, to develop their skills, and also as a systematic mechanism of harnessing all the human potentials through um, science and technology as an area of focus. Another area of reflection is the interface of innovations in curriculum and science and technology as a pathway to education for social progress in Africa. Another one, specific thought on the gender factor as one of the most critical areas of differentiation in search for permanent building measures with science and technology <laughs> as an area, a focused area. And considering um, the issue of convergence between science and technology, critical thinking. You know, the last speaker uh, talked about the different ways in the case, using the case of Mali, the different tracks, the different disciplines in which uh, the student enroll. But would it be either or, would it be a matter of reflecting on how to structurally organize all those areas, all those disciplines. Are there any disciplines that are irrelevant? Or is it a matter of how they are, uh, um, um, uh, they are um, the focus they represent in relation to the other disciplines? So the question here is, um, consider the issue of uh, convergence between science and technology, critical thinking, and philosophical questions of the model of society in African education towards social progress. 
And then finally, demystifying and appropriating or re-domesticating, renewing and updating knowledge in science and technology for African education and social transformation. So these are very broad areas. Uh, maybe we can start, you can decide to choose any aspect uh, that uh, really better reflect uh, your own contribution, uh, reflection and uh, um, practical uh, solutions uh, as uh, we want to move forward. So. Hello, um, my name is Solomon Asafa and I'm the Vice President for IBM Research. Uh, you might have made a mistake by starting with me instead of our young uh, contributor there who's probably <laughs> wiser and has a lot to say, but anyway. Um, by training I am uh, an engineer and, uh, and a physicist, so oftentimes, you know, when confronted with such complex questions, I try to kind of find uh, a simpler framework of thinking about them. Oftentimes, maybe it does not really uh, reflect you know, the reality, but at least it provides a little bit of a framework of uh, you know, thinking. So, you know, a lot of my life is on technology, and at the moment, you know, uh, I manage you know, uh, many IBM research scientists and engineers. So, we do understand you know, the current context, so maybe let me start with that. Uh, and the current context is obviously there are exponential technologies. There's a lot that's happening in artificial intelligence, which means machine learning, deep learning. There's a lot that's happening in the world of Internet of Things, which is sensor networks. Some of you might have heard of you know, blockchain, a new type of distributed ledger systems. You know, a lot of you know, work that's happening on quantum computing and so forth. So, that is definitely transforming our world. That is transforming how we operate, right? That is transforming industries, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, but the reason I mention those you know, technologies is because you hear a lot about them, but it just did not happen in a day. It did not happen in two years or five years. It took decades of investment, and it took decades of many professors and students working on them to get to the point that we are you know, at the point. We take it for granted that we have our mobile phone, we interact with it, and we have access to a lot of technologies, but that's decades of investment. So that is related to higher education and what needs to happen in terms of you know, when we think about the African context, right? There isn't much that's happening. Even South Africa invests only less than 0.8% of GDP into R&D, right? So yes, we could be you know, users of some of the technologies that are developed, but if we really want to be at the frontier, there is a lot that needs to be transformed, and there is a lot of investment that's uh, required. But, um, so our industries are transforming, and that's related to the future of work, right? If you look at healthcare, for example, uh, now we have, you know, machine learning and image recognition applications that can easily look through radio uh, you know, radiology reports and x-rays and so forth, right? So now that doesn't mean that the doctor or the nurse or the radiologist gets replaced. It just means that these machines can work and augment the doctor so that uh, they will be able to catch some of the, uh, you know, diseases or some of the symptoms that our brain cannot catch, right? So, you know, there's a lot of complement, com machines and these technologies will complicate, com complement the human. Uh, if you look at agriculture in the same way, right? At the moment you can actually layer satellite data, sensor data, and you know, surveys and so forth, align them and query them so that uh, on demand you're able to inform you know, um, a farmer as to when to plant, how to plant, and also verify that they're getting the right type of seeds, there's trust in the system, the value chain is transformed and so forth, right? So again, in that context, yes, the, the work of the you know, um, farmer is changing. It's beyond the usual uh, you know, taking a, a shovel and digging. It's also becoming more or less a micro data scientist, a data scientist in a way, right? So 
Uh, I can give you more examples as well in financial services, education, you know, how the role of the teacher is changing. But um, more or less, I see, I see these technologies, if harnessed well, actually being very, very useful, right? Um, so now, then you come to the, the question of, you know, what does it mean for the African context? In the African context, um, as well, you know, there is there is a question of do these technologies, um, you know, sometimes help leapfrog, or is it going to be that it's going to lead to deindustrialization before even uh, industrialization happens? And and I think we need to think very carefully about it. And and let me just give you a very simple example. Once again, going back into healthcare, um, if you could provide a village healthcare worker with a very simple mobile phone that's well designed and I'll, I'll come back to why I'm saying you know well designed if you can provide you know some simple AI algorithms that actually are in the mobile phone or somehow connected with the cloud which is very very you know cheap at the moment then all of a sudden you're enabling that nurse or healthcare worker to be doing much more than what he or she can do at the moment right they can go into diagnosis and you know helping patients in the village manage diseases and helping them with uh, you know, drugs and what they take and so forth, right? So for me, those applications actually end up creating more jobs. They end up creating more healthcare workers. There's no way in the world that in 10 years we'll be training a million doctors. Governments cannot afford it or they actually don't have the mindset to invest in such a manner. So if we look at the future of African development, then we need to think creatively about how do we harness this type of technologies, right? So that just gives you the context as to, you know, we need to move away from what we read on a daily basis as to how artificial intelligence is coming and how it's gonna remove all jobs and how humans are gonna be replaced and the brain is gonna be, you know, connected to machines. That's, that's just it's not gonna happen anytime soon. Right, so, so I'm setting the context to now connect it to higher education. What does it mean for higher education systems? Well, you know, our higher education systems need to, you know, um, adapt so that they can teach these new technologies to our students. Uh, they need to create more entrepreneurs, right? We also need to be able to create intellectual property. Like I mentioned at the start, it's not about just utilizing things that already exist. It's about us creating intellectual property that is locally applicable, which is why I mentioned when you talk about the healthcare worker, then the healthcare wor worker has to, able to, to use, has to be able to use it, which is the user interface design, the user requirement gatherings, and all of that based on our local context, right? So there's a lot of you know, transformation that needs to happen at a much, much faster rate in our education system. I think I'll stop there. Hi everybody, my name is Neko K. Karu. I love entrepreneurship and I think um, with entrepreneurship we can unlock some of the challenges that we face on the continent. Um, based on what Indri had said, uh, I believe the pathway uh, for youth livelihood lies um, in unlocking and changing the mindsets of the youth. Um, and I'll piggyback on what he was talking about. So yes, it has to be entrepreneurship, but um, we have to look at education and the type of education. So when we talk about the future of work, for us, I'd like to look at it from three perspectives. Um, the actual work itself, um, the workforce, and the workplace. The curriculum that we currently have um, across the continent, a lot of them are outdated. We're preparing youths for jobs that don't exist by the time they graduate. Uh, we're preparing them, we're bringing out and churning out world seekers rather than world creators. Um, so if we're looking at that pathway, I think there's need for us to go back and look at not just the curriculum, but the people that are training these youths. Uh, and what kind of mindset are they coming out with? Uh, the, the future of work means that they need to uh, be very adaptable. It means that um, they have to be very flexible and they have to be very resilient. A lot of things are being taught currently cannot help them. Um, if I use my university as a case study, uh, we just graduated our first undergrad this summer. And no matter what program that you're doing, every 
undergrad must take an entrepreneurship uh, module, and it's a one-year module. And during that one year, um, these students have to start a business, run a business, and liquidate the business. So they get a seed capital. It's not much, but it's something. Um, and they're graded based on different things, and none of them have to do with uh, having to read and, and pass like all the other courses, the way they teach it um, in Nigeria. Um, so they have to prepare a pitch. We actually get bankers to come. Uh, they have to pitch to those bankers. They have to um, form, create a platform, a marketing platform, so like a trade fair. So they're graded based on those things. And at the end of the year, so it's a second year uh, module that they have to take, and it's not an elective, it's compulsory. Uh, but what we found out is that by the end of that year, most of them do better in their grades because they're learning life skills. Um, so the idea of somebody going to school to study uh, law when they're not even sure what they're going to do with that law degree um, is it, something that we're reflecting on. So uh, I think from my perspective, when we talk about youth livelihood, we're saying that we want them to be able to um, not just be able to earn a living, but solve the challenges that we have on the continent. And the only way you can do that um, is, is by doing these four things. And I like to acronym like MIME. So the first thing is uh, the mindset. What's the current mindset of the youth um, on the continent? A lot of, we're consumers. We need to find a way to shift that. So we have a very huge consuming youth population, uh, meaning that whatever you bring, they're going to consume. Uh, we need to change that. They need to start looking at things differently. Uh, the second thing is that um, we need to introduce um, the culture of internships. It's not something that um, is widely known across the globe, especially in my country, it's just starting. We need to have more internships. Um, and then mentoring and continuous learning because half of the things that they're learning by their first year, they find that by the time they're graduating, that it's, it's totally um, irrelevant. But I'll stop here so that others have a chance. I know you have to catch a flight. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, rather. Uh, my name is Simon Ray. I am from Tanzania. I, I work in Togo uh, for uh, a Pan-African bank, EcoBank. Uh, I'm in charge of group talent, learning, and organizational development. And I'm also privileged enough to head up our EcoBank Academy, which is a corporate university in charge of training about 16,000 people annually. Now, uh, obviously, when you speak about the future of work, uh, this is something that I have to deal with every single day. And I have to deal with this uh, in 36 countries across the continent. So for me, this is real. And, uh, and I thought perhaps with the little time we have, maybe I can share a couple of things that I believe we as a continent need to do um, to, to capitalize on so many opportunities uh, that I see are presented uh, when we look at the, at the future of work. Now, it is true when most people hear about the future of work, they think about losing jobs. Um, uh, but, but again, if you look at the recent research, for example, one from uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, we're clearly seeing that uh, there will be more jobs created in the coming few years. But unfortunately, uh, most of the jobs we know today may end up disappearing because they'll be replaced by the machines. So when a young person, youth, is thinking of entering an organization, say, like EcoBank, uh, we will do everything we can to attract him or her to join us because he or she has the best education. But the journey actually starts there. Because the first thing that I think we need to do as a continent is to embrace the idea of continuous learning. I think continuous learning is a new composition. So I can give you the bonus of whatever thousands of, of dollars every year, uh, but let's be honest. About 12 months later, you become irrelevant. Because research again shows us that 30%, over 30% of workers, what they know today, 
This is how fast. In three months from now, may end up becoming irrelevant. The sector that we are in as a financial institution, the digital banking is changing, and it's changing so fast. Regulations are introduced every other day. We're playing a catch-up now. So what our, let's say, for example, relationship managers used to know January this year, well, they will have to be trained three, four times. So we as an institution need to invest much more uh, in developing uh, our talent. The second thing that I believe is important uh, when we think about the, um, uh, the future of work, uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for organizations across the continent to partner uh, with education institutions because this cannot be left to just governments because the rate of ideas and skills that is required is pretty fast. And, um, uh, and I think that also presents another uh, great opportunity. Another thought um, that I think is important for us to consider um, when we think about the, um, uh, 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 the future of work is how we embrace the idea of mentoring. Now, the classic mentoring is I need to mentor her. But actually, uh, as I'm no longer youth, <laughs> as per the category of African Union, she will be mentoring me very soon. So the idea of reverse mentoring um, uh, is quite key. And in fact, uh, some of our senior managers here in Côte d'Ivoire, at Ecobank Côte d'Ivoire, had to go through a reverse mentoring process uh, whereby you can imagine the MD now get mentored by a 21 to the two year old uh, on how they interact with digital platforms, uh, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I see more opportunities when I think about the future of work for Africa than I see obstacles. But clearly, um, uh, the private sector needs to play a role. Um, and also, I think we need to embrace the idea that being a young continent is a good thing. It's a good thing, and, um, and we can achieve much more uh, together if we collaborate. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Wekesa, and I'm a lecturer in uh, journalism, media studies, and international relations at uh, Univ the University of uh, Witwatersrand Rand in South Africa. And I'm, uh, nationally, I'm uh, his neighbor from Kenya. Um, so I call myself an African Kenyan, uh, just so that uh, we are clear about that. Um, and my interests actually are in media and foreign policy. And therefore my discussion, my brief discussion today is a link in those respects. Uh, as I was coming here, in fact, what, what one of the books that I'm currently reading is actually on, uh, on uh, an American president called Barack Obama. And in the course of reading this very massive uh, biographical book, I came across the fact that the African-American Institute, then called African-American, actually paid his way to University of Honolulu in 1959. And actually kept on then supporting him all the way to when he actually went on to Harvard. Why I use this anecdote as an entry point is the fact that international ex uh, educational exchanges are very important. And now when I say that, I know that I'm speaking to the converted. I shouldn't, in fact, be going that direction. However, that's my entry point as well. I do not think that we have done enough as Africans to enhance, increase, and uh, promote intra-Africa educational exchanges. So much so that when we talk of international educational exchanges, we are talking about Africans going to China, like I did, going to Germany, going to UK, going to US, and so forth. We list, we can actually also reverse that, and this is what I see as a gap, 
and look at the possibility of a national from Lesotho, for example, going to Mali, or someone from Ghana going to Tanzania, someone from uh, you know, University of uh, Alassane Ouattara going to University of Lekon in uh, Ghana, someone coming from a university in Burundi to a university in Senegal. I just do not understand why this intra-Africa educational exchanges have not taken root. Uh, this, is, this actually creates a problem in the sense that we tend to think that knowledge emanates only from the Western world or the Oriental world of China and so forth. Yet, we actually have knowledge systems on the continent that are continental that speak to the African experience. We are missing out by not tapping into this. Another anecdote that I would like to uh, share with you is that growing up and going to University of Nairobi for my bachelor's education, I was actually taught by a Ghanaian uh, lecturer and a Ugandan lecturer and, uh, and, 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 and a lecturer from uh, Nigeria who actually took us in literature. Now it appears that only South Africa currently has this international, uh, you know, African internationalists or global citizens teaching in universities. Because when I went back to University of Nairobi recently, I found that we have gone nativist. We become very tribal. We almost uh, all the lecturers are Kenyan. Um, and I'm certain that if you go to a university in Niger, you are very unlikely, it, it, it's unlikely that you'll find a lecturer from Egypt. If you go to Morocco, you are unlikely to find a lecturer from Rwanda. Neither is it a common practice to find students from one African country in another African country. So, in essence, therefore, we are losing out on intra-African knowledge that can perhaps help us, you know, overcome some of the homegrown problems that we face. Now, very quickly to my proposals for way forward, I do think, and I wish the ministers were here, uh, I, I would like them to propose that perhaps the ministries of education in, the, in these various African countries can consider offering limited numbers of uh, scholarships. I mean, we shouldn't just always be on the receiving end. Even if we just did one scholarship from each of the 54 African countries to another African country. In a year, we'll have 108 Africans in various African countries. We can encourage people like AAI and British Council, whom, uh, whom I've seen represented here, and others who offer scholarships to consider African students being sponsored to go to an African, another African country. Or if they go to a US university, we can have an arrangement where they go to an African country that is not their home country, so that we expand these experiences. We can encourage people like EcoBank and other corporates to consider sponsoring students from one country to another country rather than just sponsoring uh, you know, students within their countries. And finally, uh, among other ideas, uh, I know that we have to be brief, is that the African Union has uh, various aspirations under the Agenda 2063. I think the relevant aspirations um, is, uh, of the seven is uh, aspiration number two and aspiration number five, which all talk about multiculturalism on the African continent, through integration of, you know, leading to the integration of the continent. And one of the avenues that we can use to achieve this, I think, is the um, African, uh, you know, AU virtual varsity, which actually plays in the area of digital education that we're talking about. How can we reinvigorate the uh, virtual, uh, AU virtual university to play a role in uh, intercultural, cross-continental, intra-Africa work. Thank you. Bonsoir à tous. Je me nomme Kangangé saint Anna Christel. Je suis élève ingénieur en troisième année agroéconomie à l'école supérieure d'agronomie de l'Institut national polytechnique 
Félix Foufouani de Yam Soukou. Aujourd'hui, il est me donné d'être à la table des panélistes et je vous remercie pour cet honneur. -là. Et en ce qui concerne le terme sur le travail, la force de travail, la venue du travail et l'éducation de la jeunesse, j'aimerais intervenir sur trois points essentiels, c'est-à-dire la formation classique, l'entrepreneuriat et aussi la, la recherche. Au niveau de la formation classique, je, je parle de la formation classique parce qu'à ce niveau, il, faut, il faudrait qu'il y ait une adaptation entre la demande et l'offre, c'est-à-dire la formation que nous, que nous suivons, que nous, a, que nous avons au niveau de l'école, doit être en parfaite harmonie avec la demande sur le terrain. Euh, pour exemple, ce qui se fait déjà dans mon institut actuel, c'est la création de la nouvelle filière Big Data, Data Science qui permet de répondre à à une demande bien précise qui sort d'un partenariat avec l'entreprise Orange Côte d'Ivoire et l'Institut National Polytechnique. Donc cette adaptation là permettra de pouvoir acquérir de nouvelles compétences et de pouvoir allier la théorie à la pratique. Aussi, il est important de former le personnel éducatif afin de faire, de faire une mise à jour au niveau de la formation, de pouvoir, acquérir, de pouvoir avoir une formation qui embrasse pratiquement tous les corps de métier qui existent et permettra de, aux étudiants d'être un peu plus compétents sur le, terrain, sur le terrain. Maintenant, en ce qui concerne l'entrepreneuriat, il est important de, de cultiver un esprit d'entrepreneur parce que nous avons tendance à, à, à savoir que nous, nous allons à l'école, nous devons suivre une formation pour travailler dans une entreprise, pas forcément. Nous pouvons également être porteurs et créateurs d'emplois pour les autres et aussi apporter notre pierre à, au développement de l'Afrique. Donc cela passe par l'entrepreneuriat. Aussi au niveau de la recherche, il est important que l'État puisse apporter assez d'investissement au niveau de la recherche pour permettre à ce qu'on puisse trouver des solutions et pouvoir informer les autres que nous avons pu trouver des solutions. Par exemple, lorsque l'ANADER trouve de nouvelles espèces au niveau de, du café comme l'hybride Tsenra, qui nous permet de, de, de renouveler le verger des caféiers, par exemple. Donc, c'est une recherche et il est important de pouvoir investir dans ce domaine-là si nous voulons atteindre une croissance économique élevée. Donc, pour terminer, c'est vrai que la jeunesse, que l'Afrique, à une croissance démographique élevée, dotée, euh, dominée à 90% des cas, si l'on peut dire ainsi, de la jeunesse. Cela peut être un frein, cette croissance élevée, mais si nous puissons, nous nous, nous, nous nous levons et que nous arrivons à former, à pouvoir développer de nouvelles compétences, à pouvoir encadrer cette jeunesse-là, cela peut s'avérer un avantage pour nous. Merci. Merci infiniment. Euh, C'est ce que je dis à ma fille. Euh, vous n'êtes pas la leader de demain. Vous êtes déjà leader aujourd'hui. Ça se voit. <rire> ok. Bon, alors, euh, la, la, ce thème, nous allons continuer à, à le discuter tout au long, même cet après-midi, euh, demain. Euh, mais je, euh, on voudrait quand même respecter ce qui avait été convenu. Oh, OK. Ah, so, I continue in French. Okay. Um, ce qui avait été convenu, à savoir qu'il y ait un échange entre l'auditoire et puis euh, les panélistes. Euh, quant à moi et puis mon collègue ici, comme j'avais dit au début, euh, nous allons devoir nous excuser. Mais je voudrais juste aj ajouter que dans cette perspective de, du lendemain, du futur, il y a un aspect très important. Il faut être audacieux. Ça, c'est très important. L'audace. Il ne faut pas seulement se limiter à la routine. Donc la créativité a cette dimension-là d'être audace, de sortir des chemins battus, 
pour explorer quelque chose d'autre. Je voudrais juste euh, une petite illustration. Je suis professeur, je, je dirigeais un programme de doctorat euh, international qui était basé à Lomé. J'avais pris une année sabbatique. J'étais tentée d'aller euh, là où je pouvais avancer mes recherches. Mais je me suis dit que je ne comprends pas suffisamment le système d'éducation. Donc, qu'est-ce que j'avais fait J'avais passé mon année sabbatique au Mali, au, au niveau, euh, à l'intérieur du ministère de l'Éducation. Mais ce que j'ai reçu là comme information, comme enseignement, c'est l'équivalent de plusieurs années d'enseignement théorique. Parce que j'étais dans l'unité de planification, nous manipulions les, les statistiques, mais dans mon environnement déjà, je voyais des contradictions. Comment est-ce qu'on collecte, on fait la collecte des données que nous utilisons en tant que chercheurs pour faire nos recherches et tirer des conclusions ça m'a permis d'avoir une perspective que je n'aurais jamais eue si je n'avais pas décidé de faire quelque chose qui est un peu euh, pas habituel. Donc, c'est un des conseils peut-être pour la jeunesse, c'est vous qui, nous, qui allez nous intégrer à de nouvelles perspectives. Mais je voudrais quand même aussi utiliser un proverbe africain, euh, à savoir que la main gauche lave la main droite et la main droite lave la main gauche. La, la, les personnes aguerries ont aussi quelque chose à apporter. Et il faudrait que nous ayons la sagesse de pouvoir utiliser les deux. Il y a certains acquis, certaines expériences que les jeunes, avec toutes les compétences technologiques, pourront aussi utiliser pour nous faire avancer dans l'intérêt de l'Afrique. Donc cette inclusion dont on parlait, c'est l'inclusion aussi sur la base de l'âge. Il ne faut pas qu'il y ait une situation où on met les vieux, les vieilles au garage. Ils ont encore quelque chose à apporter. Donc euh, c'est un aspect très important que je voudrais euh, euh, inclure dans notre discussion. Et euh, mon collègue et moi, nous allons nous excuser. We, we very, as you can see, we would love to continue to be part of the discussion, but we have to move on to another uh, assignment. And uh, for me, uh, as an Ivorian, once again, uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this and to say Aquaba, as uh, my predecessors have said. And uh, I thank you very much for coming here, and we hope you will continue to come so that we rotate, uh, we go around and continue the debate. Uh, we need to have models of success that can spill over our continent. We have a lot to offer to this world, and I, I thank you very much. And uh, we're going to continue the discussion, that part. Melissa, you handle it. Just before I depart also, I just, I just wanted to you know, chime into a couple of really, really important points that were mentioned. I think you mentioned uh, internships. I mean, that cannot be emphasized enough. If you look at a lot of uh, the big companies, like Ecobank, for example, and the multinationals, we do it well, actually. I mean, you give me more data scientists, I, I mean, we'll take them in, right? But the question that I have often is how you know, if you look at the local companies, actually, is this, you know, concept of internship uh, well understood, right? I think we need to figure out a way of scaling them out, scaling out internships in even the local companies, right? Uh, it's a very cheap, you know, three month or so program, which, you know, we should be adopted. So I hope that we'll have more and more internships, you know, across the, the whole continent. And then the second one is, you know, uh, the, the point of network of universities, and, and I think you're spot on. I mean, we need to really emphasize that. You know, how do we have all these networks of universities working together? Uh, I don't think we do it well now. You know, there are some, you know, initiatives that have started, but we have to have more of that, right? Uh, so that we can work with each other. And the last one is, I mentioned um, research and development, the, the importance of research and development. 
and how we need to invest into that. But there's also the other side of it, which is there are many universities that have actually done good research and they do have intellectual property, uh, but they actually don't know how to commercialize it. They don't know how to combine entrepreneurship with the research division. They do have some uh, you know, technology offices, their technology transfer offices, but they don't work if, as effectively as they do you know, in the US or in Europe. So I think there's a lot that we need to learn uh, in that regard, in terms of how do we, you know, how do we combine uh, professors with entrepreneurs so that you know, the entrepreneurs could be more agile and move them out into some sort of commercial realm. And, and you know, it's a win-win because the entrepreneurs are able to build new businesses and the professors are more inclined to focus more on the scientific discovery and the papers. So, but, but we haven't done it very well. Uh, just to give you one example, at least how we're trying to do it at IBM. We have intentionally set up the research lab right next to an innovation hub. And we've even, even uh, changed the, the way the lab operates physically so that if you go from the innovation hub, entrepreneurs are able to have free access into the research lab so that there's that accidental interaction between the scientists and some of the uh, professors from WITS that visit our labs with the entrepreneurs. You know, you intentionally even, we intentionally set up spaces, lunch, you know, foosball tables, table tennis, so that that kind of interaction happens organically. And we're already seeing quite a lot of, you know, good success stories coming out where some of the innovations, assets that we've developed are, you know, being shared with entrepreneurs and they're actually commercializing it. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you so much.